sperms are the larval stage of darkling beetles, and they will stay at the larva stage for about six months, as long as they are in close proximity to other larvae. Once the worms develop into beetles, they can breed and lay hundreds more eggs. Purchasing the worms to begin with is pretty easy online because they are popular food choices for reptilian pets. And as I mentioned before, they live for longer than mealworms and are bigger. This means that they eat more food per day, but also spend more time eating that food. After the polysyrene is eaten, a bit more than a third is converted into carbon dioxide, and the rest is turned into waste, which we call fraz, which has a somewhat simpler molecular structure and takes up less volume. So it really decreases the size. But the question that I wanted to explore is how to increase this feeding behavior. So the, object, the objective of this project was to determine the effects of additional nutrition on feeding behavior in superworms by comparing differences in food consumption between two groups. One group was provided either only polystyrene and the other was provided polystyrene and oats. My hypothesis was that diet would affect feeding rate. And I predicted that the group fed polystyrene and oats would consume more than the group fed only polystyrene. And I thought this because they would have higher nutrition and this would encourage increased feeding behavior. There was a very similar but much more complex study that also compared rates of eating to multiple conditions. The most popular diet supplementation seemed to be bran. So I wanted to try rolled oats since it's also a simple carbohydrate cheap and really common. <laughs> so <laughs> I ordered 700 superworms off the internet, as one does, for about $30. They arrived from Iowa about a week later. There were a lot of size options since they are usually pet food, but I bought the smallest option to optimize their lifespan. Before beginning the experiment, I kept them in my house for about a month in the hopes that they would acclimate to the environment. And I wanted to be sure that they did have this gut bacteria to digest polystyrene, and they did. <laughs> I then randomly assorted about 35 worms into one of 20 containers, as you can see in this picture, and also put eight grams of polystyrene in each cup. And then 10 of the containers, I also put in eight grams of oats. As you can see in the picture, I hot glued a wire screen to the top of each container so that the carbon dioxide could escape to avoid any humidity problems and so that I wouldn't have worms in my house. All 20 containers then went into a giant box along with a thermometer and a hygrometer so that the worms would always be in the dark. I visually checked on them every day but after five days, I measured them. To do this, I shook the frads out of the top of each cup through the mesh and then weighed it. Every group in the polystyrene only treatment completely ingested all polystyrene by the 10th day. So this didn't take very long. The difference in weight told me how much food had been eaten and what amount of time, which gave me the rate of eating behavior to, be to compare between the two treatments. And my results were significant, which is always great. That's what we hope for, but we can't be biased. I did find a significant increase in food consumption in the mixed diet condition that had access to polystyrene and oats compared to the groups that only had polystyrene. To find these results, I had to use the non-parametric alternative to the independent t-test because the results did not have a normal distribution. Don't worry, normal distributions aren't very common when we look at animal behavior. Anyway, the man Whitney Yu compared the differences between the two independent groups because my dependent variable was continuous. It found a significant difference at a confidence interval of just over 95%, so that's really good. As I mentioned, I divided the difference in weight of each container by how long the worms had access to food. This gave me the rate of consumption per container, which I divided by 35, the number of worms in each container. This gave me the average amount of food eaten per day and per worm, which doubled from 3.4 milligrams to about 6.8 milligrams in the condition of polystyrene and oats. I'd like to now say that if you had super worms and want them to eat as much polystyrene as possible, also give them other food. But, any, but also, I cannot summarize that from this experiment. So let's talk about what I was actually measuring when I shook out the fraz and measured the contents of each cup. So I was only measuring how much total food had been eaten. So for accuracy, I should have weighed the pieces of polystyrene because the behavior that I really wanted to manipulate was the eating of polystyrene. I realized the importance of this distinction because by the 10th day, most of the groups in the polystyrene only condition had eaten literally all of the available polystyrene. In contrast, most of the groups in the mixed diet condition had happily eaten a lot of oats, about half of the polystyrene. So this is a little misleading. I'll show you a picture on the next slide. There we go, okay. So as you can see in the picture, the container at the top and on the right were polystyrene only groups. One of them ingested all of the polystyrene and the other one was about done. In the bottom container, most of the superworms were eating the oats. I can't determine if they prefer the oats more, even though this would make sense for nutrition, or just like being at the bottom container or something else. 
So I did successfully hypothesize that the mixed diet condition would eat more food, but they didn't technically eat more polystyrene. Regardless, I did find out some really cool things. First, the superworms that I ordered from Iowa can actually eat polystyrene. Second, the superworms responded well to diet supplementation, and I'd recommend that for any potential at-home superworm owners. And if you're interested in this opportunity, I would like to point out that superworms are also very low maintenance. They can't get too hot or too cold, but they also don't need much attention or space, and they don't smell. <laughs> Additionally, you can buy superworms once and then learn how to breed the adult darkling beetles for replenishment of your stock. Just please be responsible when releasing non-native species around you. You might also be wondering at this point if our global polystyrene problem can be solved with superworms. That question is a bit out of my scope, but I would direct you to a really great analysis done by Billen and colleagues of how waste management systems operate around the world. They concluded that it would be cost prohibitive at this point to manage the billions of worms needed in a large waste management system. However, they did indicate the further research of the enzymatic processes of that specific bacteria and how that could be of use someday. In conclusion, for future study, I would change my measurement process, as I already described, so that I could accurately influence the superworms to consume more polystyrene. One thing necessary for this would be a better scale, because I was using the one I usually use for baking, uh, because polystyrene is very lightweight by design. I would also be curious what other factors would influence this behavior. For example, would the worms eat more when they're warm or densely packed or exposed to light or when they're young and growing or mature and big? You know, there's a lot, there's a lot to learn. Anyway, here are the papers I reference in this presentation, but I have a lot more and I'd be more than happy to email you a PDF if anything caught your eye. So any questions, lingering thoughts or experience with superworms that you'd like to share? Okay, great. Thank you, Lark. Wonderful. Um, we have time. We have a few minutes for questions, so uh, feel free to type in the chat and add any questions. Uh, Lark, I'm wondering if you could, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of students are watching this today, and perhaps uh, some of our uh, freshmen and sophomores imagining themselves getting into research. I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on what you learned about the research process throughout the course of this project? Sure, right. So this was kind of in the situation of COVID, so I didn't um, have access to a lab, so that kind of changed how this would look. Um, but I did learn that my um, scientific brain has more power than I thought because I really don't like bugs or anything that moves or is small. Um, so I was really kind of freaked out by this. Um, but then the more I learned, the more that changed. So that's always really cool. Um, also, of course, figured out that I was kind of not measuring what I wanted to be measuring. So that's always um, the downside. But um, it was, it was cool to like completely run my own research and kind of go off of what other people have been doing. Like that's kind of what we want within the scientific community is to read papers and then kind of contribute your one little thing and then kind of keep pushing it along. Um, and so that was really, really pretty rewarding. So we do have a question in the chat from Kiva Nice Web. If someone wanted to use worms like this to manage one's household amount of waste, what recommendations would you give for practical use on a small scale? Right, excellent. So um, I actually did keep my worms from this experiment to do this exact thing. Um, they eat styrofoam very slowly, um, but I would definitely recommend just a big box and then a kind of breaking up your styrofoam and putting it in there and then keeping all of your worms in there. Um, and then they seem to, I don't know if this is scientifically accurate, but they seem to kind of prefer fresh styrofoam. So after they've been around it for a while and they've kind of eaten off a lot of it, it kind of gets kind of see-through in a weird way. And so I would just pull that styrofoam out um, and keep shuffling. Um, but they were, this is really, really easy to keep in your house. Um, and you're not gonna randomly get little uh, beetles. That's what my parents are really worried about at my house. Um, but if you look at pictures of the life cycle of superworms, um, they have this larvae state where they're the little worms. Um, and then they go into a chrysalis. So it's kind of like a cocoon almost. And so they're like immobile and it just looks like a little um, like croissant, it's tiny, right? Like they're tiny. Um, so you could easily pick those out and ethically um, get rid of them um, before they turn into beetles, right? So that wouldn't really be a problem. Um, 
and yeah, so essentially you would just need to get them and then you would put them in a space and then give them something to eat. Um, and then there's a lot of YouTube on this, a lot of YouTube video and content on this. A lot of people like to have insects in their house, I guess, um, which isn't me, uh, but I've seen some really cool setups in like garages and stuff um, where they kind of filter, they, they can do really cool things of like um, sets of drawers and sets of like Tupperware, like there's some really, really awesome things out there. So if you wanna get kind of creative with it, then you can have a pretty easy system that's really low maintenance. Excellent question. Yeah, wonderful question. Well, if we, uh, um, if we get any more, we'll pass them on to you, Laura. Perhaps you can answer them uh, separately. We're tied on time. We're gonna move on to our second presentation. Our next presenter is Elena Cisneros. Elena is an environmental science major with a geology minor. And her plans in the near future are to work in the public sector, such as the Department of Natural Resources. And she's obviously not yet graduated and already had some interviews lined up, which is really exciting. Now, Elena's project was actually part of her capstone for the environmental science major. And it really represents, I think, a, a great example of a creative, just fun project that worked really well in the midst of a pandemic. And it's amazing, you know, that with all the folklore surrounding woolly bear caterpillars that we have yet to find any really any evidence of anyone just actually testing those ideas with any rigor. And Elena's work really represents kind of the first attempt at doing that. So I will turn it over to you, Elena. So as Dr. Bennett stated, my research was on woolly bear caterpillars Periodica Isabella to determine if they can, in fact, oh, predict the weather. So just some background. Okay, just some background on them. They are part of the subfamily Arctinae, which includes hundreds of species. But P. Isabella is the official woolly bear predictor species because they have the banding. They can be found throughout the United States, Mexico, and southern Canada and they are most often recognized by the bristles that cover their entire body. They are a bivoltine species, which means that they have two broods each season. The first brood, which is the smallest, is in May, and the largest is in August, which is why you most often see them crawling around on sidewalks in the fall. So research has shown that the banding patterns are highly variable, but there have been some factors suggested, like precipitation temperatures and changes with growth. And one really interesting factor is that they can survive sub-freezing temperatures by producing cryo protectants. And these cryo protectants basically prevent their cells from creating ice crystals that allow them to freeze solid during the winter and come back once temperatures come above freezing. And they mature into these beautiful tiger moths. So there has been a similar study done, but it was back in 1948 by Dr. Curran, and he was the curator of insects and spiders at the American Museum of Natural History. And he actually conducted this with a fellow entomologist from the museum. So one day they decided to go out and collect 15 caterpillars off of a highway in New York. And he popularized this folklore when his prediction was proved correct because the local newspaper, the New York Herald Tribune, picked up his study, and so this got it going. And he actually did the study for the next couple of years to come, but I could not find if he was correct all the time for what ratio he was. So 1948, kind of hard to see that. So woolly bears actually have a really good reception with the public. They have two main festivals. The first one on the left is from Vermilion, Ohio, and that is the Woolly Bear Festival. And it has been going on since 1972, and it gets around 15,000 visitors each year. And they have a mascot, which is Wolfer, the Woolly Bear. And their big event is the Woolly Bear 500, which is a race to see which caterpillar will crawl down the ramp the fastest. And the winner then gets his, the banding red and that will predict the upcoming winter. 
On the right is the Woolly Worm Festival, which happens in North Carolina. And they get about 20,000 visitors, so this is the bigger one. And what's cool is that the winner actually gets $1,000, which is surprising. And each year there is 12 to 15,000 wild-caught warriors. That's a crazy amount. So just some background on folklore. There are multiple versions, but they all follow about the same pattern, that the banding pattern predicts the upcoming winter weather. So woolly bears, they only have two colors usually. It will be black or a reddish orange band that can sometimes be interpreted as brown. But the black bands are said to represent snowfall and harsh winters, and the reddish orange bands represent a average, more average temperatures and a mild winters. And you can see for each caterpillar, the banding ratio varies, which is what the folklore came from. So the objective of this study was to measure banding patterns in a large geographically diverse sample of caterpillars. And we wanted to determine whether these banding patterns were actually relative to three key variables. So for finding all of these caterpillars, we used bugguide.net, which is a online database from Iowa State University, specifically the Department of uh, Entomology. And this database just allows the general public or other scientists to upload pictures of insects and that will then be professionally identified by the entomologist at the university. And we found just over 100 specimens that were clear enough to be measured in from the United States and we just chose the United States because it would be harder to find all the data on out of country pictures. And we restricted the specimens to, basically the picture was captured in July, some July through December, because it's all pictures. And we chose July because the largest group and the one that we're focusing on was the August one, but July would capture any early calipers that have and then we use ImageJ, which is an image processing program created by the National Institute of Health to measure the banding pattern and to get a relative ratio. ImageJ measure, measures the pixels in an image, and that's how we got the ratio for them. For finding the weather variables, we used historical weather data and GIS maps for the closest available locality for each specimen. And we were able to get close enough, about five to 10 miles, which is pretty good. The weather data came from the Midwest Regional Climate Center and from NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So, after we figured this out, we compared the relative proportion of black banding against three factors, age, precipitation, and harshest of winter. Then to test these factors, we used variables as proxies to test them. We tested for absolute date collected, relative precipitation, and relative date of first freeze. Then we tested for significant correlations between the banding pattern and the variables date collected, precipitation, and first freeze. So for our results, we found that the relative proportion of black was around 50-50. It was 48% with a 2% standard deviation. The absolute date collected fell around on day 276, which is October 3rd, with 34 days standard deviation, which just means that most of the data came from August to November, with October being the, where most of it lied. The relative precipitation experience the mean was positive 0.66, which just means that they experienced 0.66 inches more precipitation per year than we would expect based on the historical averages at each location. And the relative calendar date of first freeze, we found that the difference was around one week later, which just means that the caterpillars experienced a freeze date that was a week later than we would expect, again, based on historical averages. So for our results, for calendar date collected, we found no significant correlation between banding and age. Our R value was negative 0 
and our p-value is 0.4h, which is not significant. For relative precipitation, we found, again, no significant correlation between banding and precipitation. Although the p-value is 0.07, it does not meet the threshold of significance of 0.05, and the correlation is basically non-existent at negative 0.19. For first free experience, there is no significant correlation. Our R value was 0.04 and the P was 0.71. And this is just a table of the key results. And the sample size varied because some caterpillars would not have the precipitation data or they would not have the historical free states. So we were not able to get data for all of the caterpillars. And some conclusions. To date, this is the most rigorous study known that tests fully bear folklore. And there is no significant correlation between banding patterns with age, precipitation, or harshness of upcoming winter. While we were doing research for this project, we found that most references would say that banding changes with age, but they would not cite any references to studies or experiments. So really, it's still unknown, but just from our data, you can see that there is no correlation. And to possible follow-ups, you could do a detailed study at a single locality. For example, you could collect all the caterpillars from one season in mid-Missouri, see how that happens, or you can just do a rearing experiment, which will probably give you the best results, because you can write down all of the factors that have been affecting it as it has been going through all its stages. overall, there's no correlation that we have seen. Okay. We have some time for questions. Thank you, Elena. So if you have some questions, please uh, feel free to type them in the chat. And as we're waiting for that to populate with any questions, I wonder, I turn the same question to you um, that I asked Mark. Um, just obviously students are looking at this, perhaps imagining themselves presenting, getting involved in research. Yeah, what did what did you learn throughout this process? Um, I found that it is hard to get a large sample size of a creature that's only around for a couple months. But bugguide.net was definitely useful and it was pretty interesting actually. It can be tedious entering all that data, but I think it was worth it in the end. I do it again if I have a chance. Yeah, and of course, you know, leave my uh, home state of Ohio is one of two places in the nation that have a festival for woolly bears and representing Ohio. Another question? Yes, our uh, first question here comes from Lark. Uh, were you expecting a correlation? I was expecting a little bit of correlation with possibly age, because you would expect, if banding did have anything to do with age, you would expect, you know, a caterpillar that has less black to be younger. And if you're capturing that caterpillar when they're younger, then you know it might indicate that there is a harsh freeze coming up or that they were just young enough when they decided to have to overwinter, when their instincts kicked in that they need to go find somewhere to overwinter for the season. So I did think that there was gonna be somewhat of a correlation. Okay. Um, if we get any more questions, feel free. If some uh, come to mind, feel free to um, add them, and we'll pass them on to Elena. Um, but we will move on with our, our next talk. So I will actually swap out here. everyone. Um, it's with great pleasure that I introduce three students um, who apparently didn't get enough of biochemistry last spring. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, their project was uh, shortened uh, due to campus uh, closing in person. Um, and since none of the three of them, or since the three of them were not graduating, they uh, asked if they could uh, continue pursuing their independent project in biochemistry laboratory. Uh, during the, their last year, or last or second to last year. 
Um, so let me introduce them. Um, our first is Katie Carey, who is a senior biochemistry major, who I guess is actually graduating in 16 days. I didn't like that number too much. <laughs> 16 days. Um, and Katie is going to be pursuing a medical degree at AP Still University. Our second student is Natalie Needy, again, another uh, graduating senior, um, biochemistry major. She'll be pursuing her BSN at Goldfarb School of Nursing. Um, and our third student is Ashlyn LaFlane, um, who's a junior. She, too, is a biochemistry major uh, with a minor in public health. And she, too, plans to pursue a, uh, a career in the health-related uh, profession. Um, her plan is to attend medical school and uh, pursue a career as a physician. Um, so they began uh, isolating, extracting, and isolating and characterizing an enzyme called lysine. Um, and they're going to tell us a little bit about some of the work that they have done in the past year. So with that, I give it to the students. Thank you, Dr. Morrow. Okay, so we're going to get started. So before I get into what exactly lysine is, I kind of want to start with where it was discovered and how it was discovered. Um, so it's kind of a silly story. Uh, a scientist named Alexander Fleming was actually trying to culture some bacteria. He was just working with some bacteria, and he happened to have a cold at the time. And some of the mucus from his nose dropped onto the bacteria. And then he later found out that that mucus had killed the bacteria on the plate. So he was interested in why this happened. So he later discovered that it was a protein in his mucus that killed the bacteria, which is now what we call lysozyme. So lysozyme is just an enzyme or a protein that speeds up a, a reaction. And in this case, it uh, catalyzes the destruction of cell walls in certain bacteria. And you can actually find lysozyme in human milk, beers, and your own mucus. Um, and it's present in pretty much all mammals and in rivet bodies. But in our case, we took uh, lysozyme from hen egg, uh, hen egg whites, um, which is considered lysozyme C. And C just stands for chicken, since it did come from a hen. Um, and yeah, and it's located in the cell membrane of those egg whites. So we'll get into how we did that later. Um, so you might be wondering, why is this important to me? How is it important to medicine, all that? Um, so it's actually the cornerstone of our innate immune system. So it kind of aids in the protection of, you know, infections and other bacterial diseases. Um, so protection to mammals and invertebrates, like I mentioned before. And so if you look at the equation at the bottom, the reaction, um, you can see that whenever lysozyme is like in contact with this substrate, the peptide of glycan, which is a component of the cell wall, um, it goes through a hydrolysis reaction, which breaks down the peptidoglycan, and it turns it into the fragment, which ultimately leads to cell death of the bacteria. Um, and actually, it only contributes to gram-positive bacteria, which is because gram-negative bacteria has this outer membrane, which like gives it a little bit more protection. Um, so it's usually just due to, uh, to that, and then, um, yeah, so. So for part of our purification methods, um, when we first started in our biochemistry class, we were given a list of enzymes to pick from. Um, and quickly, I think we all established that lysozyme was one that we wanted to pursue based off of its role in the human body, and then it's easily accessible um, to us through the grocery store of chicken egg whites. Um, and so as we started our research, we were really inspired um, by research conducted in the Western Regional Research Laboratory um, by Alderton Ward and Fabold in 1944. So quite a while ago, um, we thought we'd give it a try again here in 2021. Um, so we started off with our initial material, egg white, um, and the very first step was to add a 2% bentonite suspension with KCL, um, which is potassium chloride. Um, and so bentonite is released as a clay. It's actually pictured um, in the top picture on this slide. Um, and it's a, like it's just uh, from volcanic ash. It's kind of neat. And it's actually found a lot of like uh, face masks and beauty masks for women today in the market. Um, so kind of prevalent in our society. Um, so the very first step was to wash it um, after we bound the egg white with the bentonite. Um, so we washed with a potassium phosphate buffer that we made in lab with a neutral pH of seven. Um, and we washed this multiple times, really trying to get off all the impurities. Um, and then finally, after we concluded multiple washes, we washed with pyridine of a pH of five. And um, what's so special about this step is during all these washes, as we're pouring off all this extra liquid with our buffer, um, the lysozyme is staying bound to the bentonite, um, but when we add the pyridine, this is causing the lysozyme to release from the bentonite, so then we're able to dispose of the clay um, and keep our lysozyme with a couple other impurities. And so because we have those impurities, our next step was to add ammonium sulfate, which is a salt, 
um, to precipitate some of the impurities out of our sample. Um, and so at that point, it's necessary to get rid of the salt because we don't want it. So we go through the process of dialysis to free the lysozyme from the ammonium sulfate. Um, and so we dialysize um, against one liter of our potassium phosphate buffer, and we kept that on ice for 16 hours. So kind of how this process works, um, as you can see here in this figure, we have a bag, and for those of you joining us from home, it's kind of just like a Ziploc bag, um, but it has a special pore size to make sure that our lysozyme stays in the bag throughout the 16-hour process. Um, so if you look at the picture, you kind of imagine that the red dots are our lysozyme, and the small blue dots are all the other impurities that we don't want. Um, and so over 16 hours in this process of diffusion, as we're going from a high concentration inside the bag to spreading out to an equilibrium of the concentration throughout the entire um, jar, we then remove the bag, and we have our lysozyme, and we also still have some impurities, but we're much better off than when we first started. And so the way that we ended up testing this for, um, for activity was through an assay. So we use a spectrophotometer, which is pictured um, on the left. Um, that's the machine that we have here in lab. And so typically it's going to measure light absorbance, um, but this is a little bit different because we're going to measuring um, bacterial or the activity of our lysozyme. Um, and so what's going to happen in our reaction tube is we'll have our buffer um, and our substrate suspension, which is a micrococcus lysodictus cell. And um, when we add our lysozyme, which is our enzyme, it will be um, lysing apart the cells. And so what we're actually measuring is cell death. Um, and so we recorded the activity rate for 15 seconds for the first two minutes and then 30 seconds for the remaining three minutes. Um, so then this brings us to our results of our um, enzyme activity. So to kind of orient you to this graph, we actually ordered pure lysozyme from Sigma Aldrich. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we had 100% uh, lysozymes kind of base our standard off of. So we ordered a sample so we could test that to see what it would look like. So over on the y-axis, you can see that that's absorbance at 450 nanometers, which that represents the optical density that Katie just mentioned. So typically that is like represented as absorbance of light. But in our case, since lysozyme catalyzes the reaction of the micrococcus like the addictive cells turning into those fragments, we're actually measuring the cell fragments becoming available. So it goes from whole cells to fragments. So that's actually why our slope, it goes negative because we're losing cells throughout the um, reaction time. So we measured that over the th five minutes total. And the way that we determined how, what this activity actually meant was um, by converting it into the unit of activity per milliliter. So by doing this, we took, or it, it's represented as 0 0.001 optical density per second. So that represents our unit of activity per uh, milliliter. So with the pure lysozyme, we were able to figure out that this had 220 units of activity per milliliter, and this was uh, conducted at a molar concentration of 4.662 times 10 to the negative fifth moles per liter. So a very, very small amount. Um, and that represented like our basis of what we can go off from there. So then we took just pure egg whites before processing it whatsoever and did our assay on um, the egg whites. So here you can see that again it goes negative, so it represents that there is some lysozyme activity. And um, we determined that there's 430 units per milliliter, which is, this seems like a big jump. However, this is representing all of our enzyme activity and all of the possible enzymes that and proteins that were in our sample. So that's why it's a bit of a larger number. So then, after ammonium sulfate, when we added the salt, we conducted an assay um, to determine what we had going on there. Um, and so you can see that our slope is not as steep and the activity actually decreased to six units per milliliter However, it has been researched that salt may inhibit um, the lysozyme from actually working properly. So it could have disrupted our um, activity due to the salt and the ions that were there since it's very like pH and solubility um, sensitive. Um, so then post dialysis, once we removed a lot of the salt, our activity went up. So you can see that we had 20 units per milliliter. So this is like good. It, it increased our activity um, after we removed a lot of the salt. 
and you can see that our slope is a little bit better. And um, it was determined that we actually had about 28.3% yield um, after we were done with all of our purification steps. So next, um, we decided to do an SDS page gel electrophoresis. Um, this was to determine the proteins that we had present within our samples. So to kind of walk you through how this process works and kind of our procedure for it, um, on the left is a figure of just a general SDS page system and how it runs. Um, so we use a polyacrylamide gel, um, and they each have 50 uh, microliter wells, so they're still rather small, um, that we then load up our sample. So we cleaned out the wells um, with some of the buffer that we had, and then we added um, 1.95 micrograms of lysozyme um, from each sample into each well, um, and they ran on the gel with an electrical current of 200 volts um, for about 20 minutes. Um, and so what this process is doing is it's separating by size, so the smaller proteins are going to run faster through the gel, um, so they're going to be seen lower, and then you can kind of see in the second and third um, picture on here just kind of how that process looks as they really start to separate out. Um, and so after that 20 minutes was concluded, we stained with Kamasi Blue, which uh, binds to the protein, and then we de-stained the entire gel um, with acetic acid to help make it more visible. And so this ended up being our results. Um, so while we can't tell you the happy ending that we completely purified and isolated um, our life design sample, we do have some results here. So to orientate you with what we're looking at, um, in our first channel we have our protein ladder. And so this is just a known um, protein sizing, so that way we can compare our samples um, to see what we have. Um, so then in our second channel we have egg whites, and our third we have our post dialysis lysozyme sample, sample, so what we've been working on, and then in the fourth we have pure lysozyme. Um, and so lysozyme is around 14.9 kD, um, and so you can see in the white box is kind of our row of lysozyme, so we definitely still have it present in activity in our sample. Um, and if you look up around the 100 kD, you can see that we were actually able to remove um, that protein, so we were able to complete some purification, um, but that was exciting. All right, so now I'm just going to talk to you a little bit more about the bacteria side of this, since lysozyme's job is to kill bacteria and protect us from those foreign bodies. Um, so what we decided to do was work with a bacillus subtilis strain of bacteria, which is gram-positive and rod-shaped. Um, and like I mentioned before, lysozyme does its best with gram-positive bacteria because it's a little bit easier to uh, kill because it doesn't have that extra membrane like gram-negative does. Um, so what we basically did was we streak purified some of this bacteria. We put it on some uh, nutrient auger, which is just like a little well plate, little petri dish almost. Um, we inoculated that and then we incubated it for 30 or for 12 hours in 37 degrees Celsius. Um, so if you look at the picture here, the one on the left is kind of what it looks like after we grew it. So all of that are different colonies of bacterial cells. And so what we decided to do with this was to treat this with our lysozyme, the egg white, and also the pure lysozyme, just to compare like how it like kills the bacteria. And what we kind of found here was almost our post dialysis lysozyme sample kind of did a better job than even the pure lysozyme, um, but we can't really back that up with just looking at it. But you can see that all three samples did in fact uh, kill the bacteria, so it did exactly what we hoped it would do. So now I'm going to kind of like tie everything together about how lysozyme actually like matters um, in regards to like our human um, innate system. So the innate immune system is a part of the immune system that is just present at birth. Um, it's nonspecific and so it can attach to, or the cells can attach to a wide variety of different um, bacterial um, pieces basically. And so that allows it to bind to a lot of different things, but it's not super, super great at like protecting you entirely because there's other parts of the immune system that have to kind of come in and help you with that as well. So there's two like main parts to the human innate um, immune system. And so the first being just like your physical barriers on your body as in like your skin, your eyelashes, your hair, like eyebrows, all those things kind of protect you from bacteria um, entering your body. And then the second um, is that in your secretion, so in like tears, mucus, saliva, um, plasma, amniotic fluid, all those different things, they have immune cells and kind of like how Natalie mentioned earlier, those help in protecting us and lysozyme can also be found in those fluids. And so lysozyme can also be found in the granular um, immune cells. And so whenever those immune cells detect like a pathogen, 
it can release the contents of its granules, and so it releases the lysozyme, and that goes to the bacteria and kills it. Um, so this is like what made us interested in lysozymes, so that's why we kind of wanted to tie it all together, and how it relates to killing bacteria, so it kills those gram positive, ne um, gram positive bacteria, as we saw in our samples. And so something interesting that we found is that when it's in the oral cavity, it can actually prevent cavities. So um, lysozyme is actually one of the main things that kills the bacteria that adheres to your teeth that causes cavities. And there's actually research being done to see if adding it to toothpaste for kids that are under five that develop um, early childhood caries, which is this cavity, um, is effective at helping prevent those cavities from forming in those children. So there's more research and that's kind of how it all ties together with the biomedical application and implications um, going forward in the future. While there are many people we would like to thank for uh, the help along the way, we would just like to give our utmost gratitude to Dr. Morrow. Um, <laughs> you guys probably can't think she's off here on the side, but um, without her, just great help, guidance, knowledge, kindness, and support throughout this entire process of over a year of biochemistry work, um, it would not have been the same, near not as much enjoyable, and without the success uh, or significant results of which we found. So we can't thank her enough. <laughs> Great work, ladies. Great work, ladies. Uh, a lot of great work, I think, done, uh, presented here today. Um, good work. <laughs> so, um, before we, uh, so if you have questions, please go ahead and type them into the chat. And while we wait for questions, I think I'll go ahead and stick with the, uh, uh, the same question that Dr. McNett has been asking, and that's about the learning process. So throughout this process, I know there's been some trials and tribulations as some equipment has uh, malfunctioned <laughs> through your process. Uh, but what have you learned? What, did, what would you uh, what would you tell your uh, yourself uh, before starting the project? What have you learned through the well, process? Well, what we learned is uh, science is really nitpicky. It's tricky, and sometimes it does not do what you want it to do. Um, hence, why we've been working on this for over a year because it took us that long just to get these results. Um, so science doesn't always work the first time. We actually ran this experiment five times um, over the course of a year and a half. Um, and the hard part was when we did get sent home from COVID, uh, the freezer that we keep the lysozyme in actually broke. Uh, so we had to start completely over when we came back. So that wasn't super exciting. But we're just really happy that in the end we did get some results that were significant. And honestly, it's just a really rewarding process and it was a great learning experience for all of us. Totally agree. <laughs> And we do have a question here, um, wondering if you could uh, add any ideas on how you could further purify the protein? Yeah, so moving forward, we would like to do um, gel affinity chromatography to try to separate out the different proteins. And so lysozyme it likes to precipitate at a specific pH, so it would be separating it based on like pH and size. So then we could like further concentrate like just the lysozyme. So that would be one of the methods that we would like to do or have done if we had time. Um, and then one of the other things that we would really like to um, explore was just doing dialysis again and seeing if any uh, salt could be removed further or if there's any other kind of impurities that were on our um, sample that would further inhibit the lysozyme activity and just see if we could make it a little bit more pure. Well, thank you so much. I think that's the end of the questions. Let's go ahead and give a virtual applause to all of our presenters in this session today. Um, great work, great research being done here. Um, so with that, I will thank you so much for attending our 1030 biology presentation session of the Undergraduate Scholars Forum today. We do have a one hour lunch break and I highly encourage you to attend the next two sessions today. Uh, the next session will be at 12.30, where there will be several presentations and poster sessions as well. Um, and our third session then will be, or I guess that would be our fourth session, will be at 1.45 today. Again, uh, the Zoom links are on Canvas or on the website. And then again, please join us today at 3 o'clock on um, the Sloth Hall for um, the Ice Cream Social. And again, one more time, one more virtual applause for all uh, uh, presenters today. Great work. Thank you so much.